Hello and welcome to Lecture 26 of Electrical Circuits 1. Today, first thing I want to do is do some review from Lecture 25. I want to restate what I mean by sinusoidal steady state response. At the very end of Lecture 25, I started talking about phasers. I want to spend some more time talking about phasers at the beginning of this lecture. After that, we're going to talk about something called phaser diagrams. It's a graphical way of displaying the information that's in our phasers. And finally, we'll see that we can avoid the step of writing the differential equation for the circuit itself by representing our circuits and their circuit elements directly in the frequency domain. Related written materials are in sections 2.7.2 and 2.7.3. Okay, I want to hit the high points of lecture 25 first. We're talking about steady state sinusoidal responses of systems. By that, I mean that I'm going to apply a sinusoidal input to the system, and I'm going to look at only the steady state response. I'm going to let t go to infinity. I'm only looking at the particular solution. I don't have to worry about the homogeneous solution. It has died out by the time t gets to infinity. Now, rather than dealing directly with a sinusoidal input, what we're going to do to make our mathematics easy is apply a conceptual input. That's going to consist of a complex exponential. It's going to have the same frequency, amplitude, and phase as my original sinusoid. The thing about this is that if I take the real part of this conceptual input, that will be my actual physical input to the system. So, the actual input in the physical world is the real part of what I'm doing with the mathematics. Now, that conceptual input, working with complex exponentials and differential equations, is relatively easy. I can determine my response due to this conceptual input without a lot of pain. In fact, when I do that, my governing equations become algebraic. Okay, a lot of the mathematical problems associated with dealing with differential equations go away. Now, when I get my response to this conceptual input, since the actual input was the real part of our conceptual input, the actual response will be the real part of the response. Now, I want to revisit the example that we did in lecture 25, hit some of the high points, and use phasor notation this time around. So our goal is to determine the current, I of t, as t goes to infinity. That means I'm interested in the steady state response if the supply voltage is V sub m cosine of 100 t. So I'm looking at the steady state response to a sinusoidal input. I'm doing my steady state sinusoidal stuff. So my conceptual input is going to have the same amplitude as my actual input, and it will have the same phase. I have a phase of zero degrees here. So this is e to the j omega t plus 0. I don't need to put the 0 in explicitly. However, if I take the real part of this, I need to get this back out. I can represent this as a phasor. My phasors have an underscore under them notation-wise. The phasor consists of the amplitude and the phase angle. So the phasor is v sub m e to the j 0 degrees. It's giving me a complex number that provides the gain and the phase of my complex exponential input. Alternate notation, magnitude, little angle sign, and the phase angle. Those two are equivalent. When I analyze this circuit, I determine my response it said that as a phasor, my current had this amplitude, V sub m over 200 square root of 2, and a phase of negative 45 degrees. So I have an e to the minus j45. Equivalently, in this notation, I have my amplitude, an angle symbol, and negative 45. This is not what I'm supposed to be finding. I need to find the current as a function of time, what this is giving me is the magnitude and the phase angle associated with the output. I've lost in here and here in the phasor notation any information about the frequency. I need to keep track of that separately. So this gives me the magnitude, the phase angle. This gives me the frequency. So I of t is this magnitude cosine of 100 t minus 45 degrees. Now I want to introduce something called phasor diagrams. It's sometimes helpful to graphically represent the information that's in the phasors. So 
these guys can be represented graphically. That graphical representation is called a phasor diagram. The phasors are represented by vectors in the complex plane with your phasor diagram. Those vectors have a magnitude and a phase angle, which is the magnitude and phase angle associated with the phasor. It essentially provides you a snapshot of the positions of the phasors at any given time. Now, for our particular example, we had our voltage phasor was V sub M at an angle of zero degrees, and our current phasor was V sub M over 200 root 2 at an angle of minus 45 degrees. A phasor diagram of these two looks like the following. It's in the complex plane. I have a real imaginary axis, ignoring the current for the moment. The voltage phasor is a magnitude V sub M and an angle of zero degrees. My phasor is represented as an arrow. I label that arrow by the, the phasor's variable name, V underscore. I also label the magnitude of the phasor, which is V sub M, and typically I'll label the phase angle as well. However, zero degrees lies directly on the real axis. There's no real reason to label that. Now looking at the current, my current phasor is shown here. I have an arrow representing the appropriate direction. It's labeled by I underscore to indicate that it's this phasor. It has a phase angle of negative 45 degrees, so it's at negative 45 degrees to the real axis, and I've labeled the magnitude V sub M over 200 square root 2. Now, an important thing to note about these is that one of the reasons you label the magnitudes is that on a phasor diagram, these are generally not to scale. And in fact, when I'm plotting phasors of voltage and current, these don't even have the same units. V sub M is in volts. This guy here is in amperes. Okay, I want to emphasize a couple of things about phasor diagrams. I've made these points on the previous slide, but they're worth stating again. The phasor lengths on the diagrams are generally not to scale. That's why we label them. And in fact, they may not even share the same units. And we put labels on them to indicate that we know the lengths, but we know that they're not accurately portrayed on the diagram. The phase difference between the two phasors is also generally labeled on the diagram. Okay, If you have multiple phasors, you usually label the phase difference between them. Now, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that what we're dealing with are signals in the time domain. And in fact, they're sinusoids in the time domain. So I want to talk about the relationship between phasors and the underlying time domain signals. The time domain signals are completely described by the phasors. The phasors give a magnitude and a phase angle that's associated with the sinusoid in the time domain. For our example from lecture 25, here was our phasor diagram. My voltage was V sub M at an angle of zero degrees. If I plot V sub M, it is a sinusoid with a zero degree phase angle. It has an amplitude V sub M. Our current phasor, V sub M over 200 square root 2 is the amplitude. It has an angle of negative 45 degrees. The red dashed line is that. You'll see it's shifted by 45 degrees to the right. Recall that that means that the current is lagging voltage for this circuit. And it has some amplitude, which is V sub M over 200 square root 2. Now, there is one thing that doesn't completely describe the time domain signal. Remember that our Frequency is not provided by the phasors. You'll also notice that I haven't labeled the time axis. From the phasors, I don't know what units to put on the time axis. I don't know what the period or the frequency of these sinusoids is. Now let's do another quick example of a circuit analysis using phasors. I want to use phasors to find the steady state value of the current I of t if the applied voltage V sub S of T is 12 cosine 120 pi. My input's a sinusoid. I want the steady state response. I'm looking for a steady state sinusoidal response from the circuit. After I get that, I'm going to sketch a phasor diagram showing the phasors of the source voltage and this current. Now, the first thing I want to do is find my conceptual input that corresponds to this physical input. I'm going to transform this input. I'm going to call V sub S 
of t is going to become the same amplitude, 12, but now the cosine is going to be represented by a complex exponential, e to the j 120 pi t. I have a zero degree phase angle, so I don't need another term here. So if I represent V sub s as a phaser, that is 12 at an angle of zero degrees, or 12 e to the j zero. Now I'm going to redraw my circuit. So this is my voltage phaser. I have a capacitor in series with a resistor. The capacitor is 100 microfarads. The resistance is 100 ohms. And my current is going to be now represented as a phasor, I underscore, which I'm going to say is some number I at an angle of theta sub I. So it's going to have a magnitude I, capital I, and a phase angle, theta sub capital I. Now let's go to the next slide, derive the governing differential equations, then we can use our phasor notation to solve those equations. Now let's derive the differential equation describing this circuit. Since we're doing a differential equation, I don't need to worry about what the specific input is. I'll leave this and i of t as variables. I can do KVL around this single loop. That will tell me if I start down here that minus V sub s and plus the voltage across the capacitor, which I'll just call V sub c, plus this voltage difference across the resistor, which if the resistor current is I, that voltage is just 100 times I, all sum up to zero. Now I can use my voltage current relationship for my capacitor to say that I is equal to C dVc by dt. I want to eliminate V sub C from these relationships so I can combine them to get rid of my V sub Cs. From my KVL equation, I can say that V sub C is equal to V sub S minus 100 times I. I can take the derivative of this and plug it in here to say that I is equal to C times dVs by dt minus 100 times dI by dt. Let me simplify that to become dVs by dt is equal to 1 over C times I plus 100 dI by dt. 1 over C is 1 times 10 to the minus fourth, so dVs by dt is 1 times 10 to the fourth times I plus 100 times dI by dt. That's our governing differential equation, which we will next use to determine the steady state sinusoidal response. Now let's use this differential equation and our assumed form of our input and output in order to solve for the actual output itself. Our governing differential equation, dVs by dt is equal to 100 times di dt plus 1 times 10 to the fourth times i of t. In the first slide of this example, we said that we're going to use a conceptual input, V sub S of t is 12 e to the j 120 pi t. This is not physically realizable. We can't create this in the lab. However, the real part of this is our actual voltage input. We're also going to assume a form for our output, which is some current phasor, I underscore, times a sinusoid in complex exponential form with the same frequency as my input. So I get an I underscore e to the j 120 pi t. I'm going to substitute these into this differential equation. In order to do that, I need dV, dVs of t by dt and dI of t by dt. So differentiating this, dVs by dt is equal to 12 times the j120 pi that multiplies the t comes down as a multiplicative factor, and then e to the j120 pi <coughs> times t, according to the usual rules of differentiating exponentials. Derivative of this one, dI by dt is equal to my current phasor, I underscore, times my j120 pi that multiplies the time in the exponent times e to the j120 pi times t. 
Now I can do the appropriate substitutions into this dif differential equation. dVs of t by dt is 12 times j120 pi e to the j120 pi times t. That's equal to 100 times di dt. So 100 times i underscore j120 pi e to the j120 pi times t plus 1 times 10 to the fourth times the current itself, which is just i e to the j 120 pi t. Now, a couple of very important things are going to happen soon. The first has actually already happened. We've taken this differential equation and converted it to this algebraic equation. There are no derivatives in this anymore. They're absorbed into these multiplicative factors here. The second thing that's going to happen is that I can cancel out my e to the j 120 pi t. If I divide through by that, this term goes away, this term goes away, and this term goes away. Now we have an algebraic equation that is no longer even a function of time. All the coefficients in this equation are constants. We'll go to the next slide and solve for this current phasor i. Now, after having gotten rid of my e to the j 120 pi t terms on the previous equation, I'm left with this. Let me do a little bit of math. This becomes j 12 times 12 is 144. 140 pi is equal to 100 times j 120 is j times 120 with another two zeros after it times i plus 1 times 10 to the fourth times i. Now we can solve this equation for i because I can group these terms. This becomes a j12 with three zeros after it plus 1 times 10 to the fourth all times i. So i as a phasor is equal to j1440 times pi over j12000 plus 1 times 10 to the fourth. Now all I all it takes me now is to do some complex arithmetic to determine the phasor i. If I do that, i becomes 0 0.166 at an angle of 15 degrees amps. If this is my current phasor, my current as a function of time, i of t, is equal to 0 0.166 cosine of, I've lost track of my frequency. I need to know what that is from my previous slide. It was 120 pi times t plus 15 degrees. There's my current as a function of time. On the next slide, I'll draw my phasor diagram. Previously, we determined that the source voltage as a phasor was 12 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, and the current, which we just solved for, was 0 0.166 at an angle of 15 degrees amps. I want to do a phasor diagram of these two phasors. A phasor diagram is on the complex plane. So I need a real axis and an imaginary axis. The voltage phasor, V sub s, is at zero degrees. It's going to lie on the real axis. So here's V sub s underscore. Got a zero degree phase angle. It's got an amplitude of 12. My current has a phase angle of 15 degrees. It's going to be at 15 degrees from the positive real axis. Now remember, these guys are not to scale, and in fact, they don't even have the same units. So this is my current phasor, I. It has an amplitude of 0 0.166. I label the amplitudes, and I label the phase difference between the two phasors. It's 15 degrees. So current is leading voltage for this circuit. It is leading voltage by 15 degrees. Now we can simplify the previous process that we used to analyze our circuits significantly. Okay, what we can do is actually write circuit element voltage current relations directly in the frequency domain. So, so far we've used phasor representations of signals in the governing differential equation to obtain algebraic equations in the frequency domain.
Okay, they were functions of frequency. Everything became algebraic, and in fact, everything became constant. Time disappeared. Time doesn't appear anymore. That's why it's called the frequency domain. It's a function of frequency only. We can do this more easily. We can take the voltage current relationships for our individual circuit elements, resistors, capacitors, and inductors, and write those directly in the phasor domain or in the frequency domain. Once we've done that, we've converted all the signals to phasors. We can convert these relationships to frequency domain relationships. The entire circuit can just be transformed into transformed into an equivalent circuit in the frequency domain. And analysis of that circuit will give us directly the governing algebraic equation in the frequency domain with no time dependency associated with it. Let's first determine the voltage current characteristics in the frequency domain for resistors. In the time domain, our resistor looks like it always did. It's a resistor with some current into it, I sub bar of t, and some voltage difference across it, V sub bar of t. Ohm's law tells us that V sub bar of t is equal to R times I sub bar of t. That's always appropriate. However, if we're working in the frequency domain, we can convert these to phasors if we're doing a steady state sinusoidal analysis. So I'm going to claim that the phasor representation for V sub bar of t is V sub bar as a phasor, e to the j omega t, and the phasor representation for the resistor current, I sub bar of t, is the phasor I sub bar times e to the j omega t. Now I can just take these phasors and plug them into Ohm's law. So I get V sub bar e to the j omega t is equal to R times I sub bar e to the j omega t. As with the case with our differential equations governing circuits, the e to the j omega t will cancel out. That will leave us with V sub bar is equal to R times I sub bar of t. So the voltage current relationship in the frequency domain for resistors looks almost the same as for the time domain. The voltage phasor is the resistance times the current phasor. Now I want to look at a phasor diagram for these relationships for a resistor. On the previous slide, we saw that for a resistor, if I have some current phasor going into it and some voltage phasor representing the voltage difference across it, the voltage phasor is just resistance times the current phasor. If I do a phasor diagram of voltage and current, the voltage phasor and the current phasor are in the same direction. There is no phase difference between these because R is a real number. Multiplication by a real number does not change the phase angle. It simply changes the magnitude. So these two guys are still in the same direction. They just have different lengths. If this is I, the length of the voltage phasor is R times the length of the current phasor. Keep this in mind. Voltage and current have the same phase for resistors. The fact that a resistor's voltage and current have the same phase means that if I plot the voltage across a resistor and its current, I'll get sinusoidal signals because I'm only looking at the steady state sinusoidal response, but these will be in phase with one another. They'll have different amplitudes, but the peaks and the troughs will line up all the time. These guys are in phase. That means that there is no shift relative of one relative to the other in the time domain. That is actually an outcome of the fact that the resistor does not store energy. The resistor doesn't store energy. There's no derivative term in its voltage current relationship. That implies that they are scaled simply by a real value, which gives us no phase shift. Now let's examine the voltage current characteristics for inductors in the frequency domain. In the time domain, I have an inductor. If there is some voltage across it, V sub L of T, and some current through it, I sub L of T, my voltage cur current relationship is that V sub L of T is equal to L times DI L of T by DT. This is always true regardless of the specific shape of the functions V sub L of T and I sub L of T. However, if I look at these in the phasor form, I'm going to convert my voltage to a phasor. V sub L of t is going to become V sub L as a phasor, e to the j omega t. The current, I sub L of t, is going to become I sub L 
as a phaser e to the j omega t since I'm only concerned here with the steady state sinusoidal response. I can take these guys and plug them into here. So I have v, which is v sub l e to the j omega t, is equal to l times the derivative of this. The derivative of this is this times j omega times e to the j omega t. The e to the j omega t's cancel out once more, and I can write the voltage phasor as being j omega l times the current phasor. This j now implies that I'm multiplying this by an imaginary number. There will now be a phase shift between voltage and current for an inductor. Now, as in the case with resistors, I want to take a look at the phasor diagram for an inductor. Previously, we found that the voltage-current relationship between the voltage phasor and the current phasor for an inductor is V sub L is equal to J omega L times I sub L. If I plot these now, I sub L is here. Multiplication by J corresponds to shifting this by 90 degrees clockwise. So now, these guys are at a 90 degree angle, and the amplitude of V is equal to omega L times whatever the amplitude of I is. Note, voltage and current are out of phase by 90 degrees. For inductors, current lags voltage by 90 degrees. Alternatively, you can claim that voltage leads current by 90 degrees. The two statements are equivalent. In either way, the current waveform is going to lag behind the voltage waveform. So if I look at the time domain voltage across an inductor and its current, I may get something that looks like this. I have a voltage curve here. The current is going to have some different amplitude They'll be scaled by omega times L, and it will be 90 degrees out of phase, and the current will lag the voltage. The peak of the current waveforms will be 90 degrees behind the peak of the voltage waveforms. This fact that these two are 90 degrees out of phase is consistent with the fact that the inductor stores energy. The derivative associated with the energy storage causes this 90 degree phase shift. For the case of an inductor, it causes the current to lag the voltage. Our final circuit element is going to be capacitors. Let's take a look at the frequency domain voltage current relationships for capacitors now. In the time domain, we have some capacitor C with a voltage difference across it, V sub C of T, and some current through it, I sub C of T. The voltage current relationship is that I sub C of T is equal to C times the derivative with respect to time of V sub C of T. Now for the specific case where we are only interested in the steady state sinusoidal response, I can use phasors to represent I sub C and V sub C. So V sub C is going to be some capital V sub C is a phasor times e to the j omega t. I sub C of t is going to be a capital I sub C is a phasor times e to the j omega t. I can take these expressions, plug them directly into this equation because this guy always works. Once we've made this substitution, we've restricted ourselves to steady state sinusoidal analysis. Keep that in mind. So my current is going to be I sub C e to the j omega t is equal to C times the derivative of voltage with respect to time. So I get a V sub C as a phasor times this j omega that comes down as a multiplicative factor times j omega times this e to the j omega t. Again, the e to the j omega t's cancel out. Once I do that, I can solve for v sub c of t, primarily because my previous relationships were given in terms of voltage on the left-hand side of an equation. I divide through by j omega c, so v sub c is equal to 1 over j omega c times i sub c as a phasor. Now, an alternative way to write this is 1 over j is equal to negative j. So this v sub c is equivalent to minus j over omega c times i sub c as well. Now let's do a phasor diagram of a capacitor's voltage current relations. This is what we found earlier. I have a voltage difference across a capacitor v sub c. A current through a capacitor, I sub C, both are phasors, and their relationship is 1 over J omega C. This mathematically says that V sub C is equal to this times the current. 
which is equivalent to minus j over omega c times the current phasor. If I plot these, current is going in some arbitrary direction because I'm not doing this for a specific signal. I said that multiplication by j corresponded to a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation. Minus j changes that direction but not the magnitude, so the voltage phasor is 90 degrees clockwise from the current phasor. So the voltage phasor is 1 over j omega c times i. It is 90 degrees behind the current for capacitors. Voltage lags current by 90 degrees. Equivalently, for capacitors, current leads voltage by 90 degrees. Okay, looking at the voltage current waveforms for a capacitor, if I have a sinusoidal voltage, I'll get a sinusoidal current with a different amplitude, but the current will lag the voltage waveform by 90 degrees for a capacitor. Again, this phase difference is due to the energy storage nature of capacitors. The derivative associated with the energy storage causes the 90 degree phase shift. The derivative for a capacitor causes voltage to lag current. It's the opposite as for an inductor. This concludes lecture 26. In this lecture, the primary thing you want to remember are the voltage current characteristics in the frequency domain for resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Because next lecture, we're going to start using those relationships to draw our circuit schematics directly in the frequency domain. This has a couple of advantages. We can write the algebraic equations governing the circuit in the frequency domain directly without having to write the differential equations. Also, since we don't have to deal with differential equations, we can use a lot of analysis techniques in the frequency domain that we were previously only able to apply to time domain resistive networks.